Yeah, yeah, we, we changed the defense plan. You no, know, back back to the original one. Yeah, yeah. So so we need all the supplies where they were supposed to originally go. Okay. They're on the beaches? Oh, that doesn't sound good. Okay. Huh. December 26, 1941. He's been one of the most visible characters of the whole war so far in both Western and Eastern Europe, and his theories are the basis for how tanks are used in general. But this Christmas, Heinz Guderian gets a present that he did not expect. This Christmas, he loses his job. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese offensives all over Southeast Asia continued to take ground. The Soviets continued to push the Germans back in the center of the Eastern Front. Elvin Rommel ordered a withdrawal from Cyrenaica in North Africa. And the Allies lost a bunch of ships at sea all over. A milestone of a conference starts this week, the Arcadia Conference. This begins the 22nd and is the first official meeting of British and American military and political leaders since the US is now also at war. They will set up a combined Anglo-American general staff to coordinate the fight against Japan and to plan for an eventual joint invasion of Europe. The first day of the conference, they agree to open an aerial supply route to China. But British Prime Minister Winston Churchill's meeting with American President Franklin Roosevelt on the 24th scares the heck out of American high command. See, Christmas morning, a British memo on what the two talked about goes around the American War Department. Apparently, FDR has agreed that reinforcements to the Philippines should be diverted to Singapore if they can't get through. American Secretary of War Henry Stimson is livid that the president would make such an enormous decision without even consulting his command. And also, what the popular reaction will be when they think the president is writing off the Philippines and implying that holding part of the British Empire is more important. Roosevelt and Churchill deny all of this, although Churchill does wire Australia the evening of the 24th to say that Roosevelt has made that pledge. Roosevelt says the paper going around is nonsense, but Stimson is aware that it is in fact accurate. Singapore might need some real help pretty soon, however. Though by the 23rd, the 11th Indian Division has stopped its withdrawal from the Japanese behind the Perak River, and David Murray Lyon is relieved of his command of it by Arthur Percival. He is replaced by Archibald Paris. Over the next few days, there's going to be defense and strategy issues here. Japan commands the sea and can land anywhere on Malaya, so there's not much point defending north of Johor except maybe for delaying actions. So Winston Churchill wants to defend at Johor and on Singapore Island. This would mean giving up Singapore as a naval base since Japan's command of the skies would make it unusable. But Percival sees his major task as protecting Singapore as a naval base, which means fighting his battles on the Malay Peninsula. Also on Christmas Day, the British Chiefs of Staff change official priorities and Singapore now ranks just behind defense of the UK itself. But hang on, what about Burma? Japan's moving on Burma as well, and in terms of pure strategy, Burma is more important to Britain than Malaya and Singapore. It's the gateway to India, but Burma is also really important to the Americans. The only land link they have to Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese Nationalist Army is through Rangoon and the railway that connects to the western end of the Burma Road. But the Australians have priorities in the other direction, Singapore. And also on Christmas Day, Vivian Bowden, the Australian representative in Singapore, wires home that the situation is critical. He calls for both huge air and troop reinforcements to come in from the Middle East. And he and pretty much every other Australian expect Churchill to honor all the promises he has made about Singapore being top priority. The Japanese are also advancing on British Hong Kong. The advance on Hong Kong Island this week is Japanese forces in often superior numbers and always superior skill overwhelming local companies of defenders. On the 24th, 53 British and Canadian soldiers are roped together and shot or bayoneted to death. The next day, over 50 wounded soldiers being tended to at St. Stephen's College Emergency Hospital and their doctors and nurses are all killed. 
The soldiers die in their beds. Actually, Richard Frank describes it like this in Tower of Skulls. The continued dogged resistance enraged Japanese soldiers who massacred at least 157 British and Canadian prisoners by bayonet, beheading, and in some cases burning alive. After slaughtering patients at a hospital, the Japanese threw mattresses upon a pile of corpses and proceeded to rape seven nurses. Three of these they then beheaded, piling their naked bodies outside. News of this episode soon spread far beyond Hong Kong's borders. On the 25th, Hong Kong surrenders. 11,000 soldiers are taken prisoner. The fact that it falls in just 18 days is a big shock to London. Hong Kong cannot expect any relief from the Chinese Nationalist Army. I mentioned last week that the Japanese 11th Army attacks toward Changsha. General Korachika Anami has a bit of a bee in his bonnet after his failure to take the city a few months ago. He drives south from below Hankou all the way to Changsha with 27 infantry and 10 artillery battalions. The attacks toward the city begin the 24th and by the end of the week are beginning to really beat back the defenders. Another little piece of news from China. On the 20th, China's AVG, American Volunteer Group, who are soon to gain worldwide fame as the Flying Tigers, see their first action in the skies. They intercept 10 Japanese bombers en route to Kunming. Three Japanese planes are shot down and a fourth is damaged to the point that it crashes before it can return to Hanoi base. I'm not gonna say more about the Tigers now. I have an idea they'll be around for a little while so I can hopefully get to them later. American possessions are also being attacked this week. Now, Wake Island went from obscurity to necessity in the mid-1930s, with Pan Am beginning to use it as a service island in 1935. For the U.S. Army, it was a vital stepping stone for getting B-17 bombers to the Philippines, a major component of America's deterrent force. There were also plans to use Wake as support for attacks on the Marshall Islands and also as bait to draw out the Japanese Navy. After Pearl Harbor, Wake took several days of bombing, then on the 11th a Japanese attack force arrived. This was repulsed, but Wake is by no means secure. So Task Force 14 has been set up around the carrier Saratoga to deliver a Marine fighter squadron to Wake, to fight back, and to evacuate the civilians. A big problem with this mission is one of delay. The oiler sent with Saratoga by necessity is slow, so speed is limited to 12 knots, which means extra days of travel. And Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher, in charge of the task force, discovered that peacetime projections miserably underestimated the fuel demands of his destroyers and weather and lack of practice at underway fueling in heavy weather further hobbled the advance. Fletcher's orders are to get to Wake by the evening of the 23rd. He is on schedule until the 22nd, but weather conditions cause more fueling delays, so the morning of the 23rd, Saratoga is still 650 kilometers from Wake. The second Japanese assault force that attacks Wake now has massive support from four heavy cruisers and two carriers with 94 planes. The 21st and 22nd, those carriers, Hiryu and Soryu, both launch air raids that take care of the final American planes on wake. At 3.20 a.m. the 23rd, the first landings are made on the Wilkes Island shore. The invaders take heavy casualties over the next few hours. This is a feint, though, as is an attack on the south shore of wake itself. To the north and to the east, the Japanese attack and overrun the airfield. As they near American command, its staff gets the message that there's no help within range. They also think Wilkes has fallen and that the Americans on the south shore of Wake are dead. This is not true, but it convinces them to surrender to avoid further loss of life. So Japan takes Wake Island, but at a cost of two destroyers, a submarine, and over 500 dead. American losses are 124 dead. Just 49 of them are military personnel. On the 23rd, 1,593 Americans become Japanese POWs. Admiral William Pye, now in temporary charge of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, orders Fletcher to withdraw the task force and not seek battle. Fletcher is apparently infuriated by this. Having said that, Saratoga would have to face combined Japanese air and sea power 3,200 kilometers from Pearl Harbor 
and if damaged, would likely be lost before any aid could arrive on the scene. The Japanese are also attacking the American Philippines. On the 20th, they continue landings at Davao on Mindanao. Davao is where two-thirds of the 30,000 Japanese nationals in the Philippines reside. The invaders take the airfield. The landing units then sail further and make landings to capture Holo at Christmas. Further north on the 22nd, 85 Japanese transports, carrying much of the 14th Army, 88 tanks, and loads of artillery enter Lingayen Gulf. They also have a strong naval escort and land three regiments. Elements of Jonathan Wainwright's North Luzon force oppose them over the next couple of days at several landing spots, but are ineffective. In fact, with some exceptions, the Philippine defenders are no match for the Japanese soldiers and are often simply routed. On the 24th, 7,000 men of the Japanese 16th Division land at Lamon Bay in southeast Luzon. George Parker's South Luzon force have been focused on defending the western beaches that give easy access to Manila. So these landings go well. The Japanese will have to cross the Tayabas Mountains to get to Manila, which they quickly do, taking the roads with an armored car thrust. On the evening of the 23rd, the overall commander of the Philippine forces, Douglas MacArthur, orders the troop withdrawal to Bataan Peninsula. The next day, he declares Manila, the capital, an open city. That evening, his headquarters, as well as President Manuel Quezon and High Commissioner Francis Serre, move to Corregidor. The withdrawal to Bataan changes the nature of the campaign. Wainwright and his troops are to conduct a fighting retreat, trading hours for miles, right? Back to the main road leading to Bataan. He is then supposed to hold that so the South Luzon force can make it into Bataan. Now, I'll talk more about this next week, but I want to talk here about the supply issue. Now, under the war plan Orange, upon the outbreak of war, supplies were to begin moving to Bataan and to continue until there was enough stuff there to feed 43,000 men for six months. But the MacArthur plan replaced the citadel-type defense of Manila Bay with an active defense of all the Philippine islands, believing he had the force to pull it off. That is the plan that they began following, but are now reverting to the Orange plan since he realizes they don't. But the Orange supply plan was canceled, and the supplies that were to go to Bataan went to supply the beaches. There are now only days to go until January 1st, when Manila is to be evacuated, to bring in all the supplies that they can get, but there is no way they can now get the huge majority of the supplies that went to the beach defenses. And on top of that, instead of 43,000 men, there will be closer to 80,000 of them. MacArthur also sharing the Philippine government's concern to not put civilians in danger, instructs his quartermaster, Charles Drake, to not take rice from the 10 million pound rice store which could likely feed the garrison for maybe a whole year. So there might be some real food issues fairly soon for his troops. In yet other Japanese attacks this week are the first raids on Rangoon, Burma, killing around 1,000 people the 23rd. On the 25th, they hit Rangoon again, killing as many as 5,000. But the Japanese are certainly not the only people attacking this week. On the 20th, the Red Army takes Volokolamsk, and Western Front Commander Georgi Zhukov orders a new advance line from Zubtsov to Gzatsk by the 27th. His real focus, though, is now on Kaluga. Taking Kaluga is the path to Vyazma, which is the path to the Smolensk-Moscow Highway, which leads to the rear of Gunter von Kluge's German 4th Army. Ivan Boldin's 50th Army is given the task, and he sends Vasily Popov with a mobile group cover the 70 kilometers to Kaluga. It's in sight by the 20th, but the fighting the next few days is vicious and he cannot reach it. Other fighting that begins its meat grinder this week is Ivan Maslenikov's brand new 39th Army, which at the end of the week starts a drive towards Rzhev. I've been talking about some changes in the German high command the past few weeks, and there is more this week. Panzer Army leader Heinz Guderian now falls victim to the German command crisis. Last week, just before the end of his command, Walter von Brauchitsch had made the second army subordinate to Guderian's second panzer army and given Guderian authorization to withdraw how he saw fit as long as he didn't lose Orel. 
But when the general order for everyone to stand fast no matter what comes down, Guderian flies to Rastenburg the 20th to explain his situation to Adolf Hitler. He insists that he must withdraw. He does this again to Kluge, who is now Army Group Commander, on the 25th, and instead of getting his way, finds himself relieved of command. Yep, Guderian is out. But for all of this desire for withdrawal among various generals, Glantz and Haus have this to say in When Titans Clashed. Like Stalin's cool conduct of the Moscow defense in late November, Hitler's stand fast order appears in retrospect to have been the correct action, even if issued out of stubbornness rather than rational calculation. The Germans lacked the resources and transportation to build and retreat to a new defensive line. For all its tactical difficulties, defending in place at least allowed the invaders to retain some rudiments of shelter, without which they would not have survived the winter. For once, the professional soldiers were wrong and the Bavarian corporal was right. Unfortunately for the German army, the success of this order encouraged Hitler to hold every inch of ground. This became his first reaction in any defensive situation, regardless of the circumstances. In the south, German attacks on Sevastopol continue all week. and the 23rd, they capture the outer ring of forts around the town. But the Soviets bring in 14,000 men there this week by sea, as well as supplies, so they're getting stronger. On the 26th, as the week ends, the combined forces of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet and two armies of the Transcaucasia Front begin their operations on the Kerch Peninsula. The plan is to relieve Sevastopol. And with that, I will end this week. Another week of Japanese advances all over Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and more Red Army gains in the USSR. And Guderian is out. Th this is the big Panzer star. The guy who literally wrote the book on tank warfare, Achtung Panzer. And Bach is gone, and Brauchitsch, and Rundstedt, all these big figures in the German high command have been relieved or resigned. And that is interesting, because when Germany was advancing, the various Wehrmacht commands were solid. It turns out that Hitler, much like Stalin most of the summer, might have a habit of rewarding the questioning of his plans with unemployment. Well, perhaps he has loads and loads of quality replacements. We'll just have to wait and see. Indy here, interrupting Indy. Um, a few weeks ago, I made a shout out to the 1418 Romagna Museum, the World War I Museum in France, and its owner, Jean-Paul, who is a friend of ours. See, because of Corona times, a lot of private museums, including Jean-Paul's museum, uh, have very hard times making ends meet and even surviving because they are not publicly funded. They rely on donations and they rely on visitors and they can't have visitors just now. So I asked if you guys could help Jean-Paul out so he could survive the winter and you did and he can. And here's Jean-Paul. Yeah, bonjour everybody. Uh, this is Jean-Paul Vries. I'm the owner and uh, creator of the Romani 1418 Museum. Uh, I'm doing this message to thank you all for your support uh, donating to this museum of Romani 1418. Thanks to the call of Indy Nadel. Uh, I had a lot of you people from all over the world who supported us. And uh, it's incredible to see that uh, all these people sending me your messages give me the new inspiration and strength to keep on going with my museum. So I promise you, this museum will keep on going. I will be passing on the, the message of the senseless brutalities of these wars. And I hope to welcome you all in my museum, Romani 1418, as you can when all this is over. Thank you very much. If you'd like to see some of what Jean-Paul has at his museum, there's all kinds of photos in some of the links below, and you can check out his website, and it is really cool. It is, in fact, the Time Ghost Army that did this emergency support so that Jean-Paul can continue. And the Time Ghost Army is what finances all of our productions, the World War II channel, the Time Ghost channel, the um, War Against Humanity series, the On the Home Front series. So if you'd like to see more and more great content in 1942, then please join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And it is almost 1942. 1941 has been a very rough year. Um, we've seen death and destruction on a scale I don't think any of us could ever have imagined. So uh, I suppose if I have any New Year's wishes, you know, although today's just December 26, but I wish for a better 1942.
I'm not going to leave you there because I don't want you to think that I'm sarcastically talking about things in the past and making light of things that happened. I will leave you with some actual Christmas or whatever holiday you choose to celebrate or not celebrate wherever you are in the world. I will leave you with some good wishes from myself, from Sparty, from Astrid, and from all of the crew. And I'll even throw in Jean-Paul. And I hope your 2021 is somewhat brighter than this apocalyptic 2020 and that wherever you're doing, you're safe and healthy and happy. See you soon. (laughs) 